so uh, let's do lecture 5.3, sketching of the root locus. And we've learned what the root locus is now, right? To remind ourselves, it's the location of the closed loop poles when, so you have a feedback loop. So it's the location of the closed loop poles um, uh, as you vary the gain k, OK? So this is going to be really important for us in terms of what are the res response characteristics of the system, because the closed loop poles dominate those. So let's, let's dig into how to sketch the root locus by hand. And once we know how to sketch it by hand, I'll show you how to do it in MATLAB as well. You need to be able to do both, because you need to understand. The sketches by hand help you understand how a pole in a given location or a zero in a given location affects the root locus. That's why we learn to sketch it by hand. So um, it's easy to get lost in the detailed rules of manual root locus construction, but I'm going to try to help us avoid that. Uh, in the old days, accurate root locus construction was critical. But now it is useful only in the sense that learning how to sketch the root locus gives one an intuition for how a given system will behave given its open loop transfer function, which is quite useful for design, because that's what we were working towards, right, is learning how to design. And uh, the old days, there were people whose job was to construct these root locus plots. They didn't even understand necessarily all of the background of like what it was useful for or even what it meant. But they learned the rules of sketching. And they sketched it much better than we're going to sketch. Because we don't need that good of a sketch. We just need a sketch that gives us an intuition for how the system's going to behave. Um, if a detailed root locus is desired, we should use the computer tools of lecture 5.4 which is the next lecture. Uh, we will construct a procedure for sketching a root locus from the following rules that must hold true for every root locus. In what follows, phrases such as has locus are used to describe segments in the complex plane for which the root locus is defined. Okay? Uh, that is, everywhere in the complex plane, uh, in, in the complex plane, uh, for which the root locus is defined, is said to have locus. Note that the sum, uh, or no, note that some of the following rules only apply for k greater than zero. Um, so uh, k greater than zero is, as we've discussed before. Um, most common situation. You can go to negative k for some situations in a limited way. Uh, and occasionally, it's useful to have an, uh, a system that is an oscillating system. And that's one reason you might go to, to k less than 0. But uh, for these rules, we're only constructing it for k greater than 0. The rules for k less than 0 can be found in Nice. It's just essentially the, like the opposite of a couple of these rules. It's very similar. So here are the rules. Rule one, the root locus begins at open loop poles when k equals 0 and approaches open loop zeros when k goes to infinity. We showed that in lecture 5.2, right? We showed that when you had uh, gain being small, the closed loop poles approached uh, uh, the open loop poles. And when gain is large, we showed that the closed loop poles approach the open loop zeros. So that's this first rule. Um, keep, good to keep that in mind. Rule two, the number of branches of the root locus is equal to the number of closed loop poles. Okay, The number of closed loop poles is equal to the number of open loop poles or zeros, whichever is greater. Um, and so essentially, you can think of these, these branches of the root locus as being uh, a path that a closed loop pole traces out when you vary the gain. Okay? So each, pole, each closed loop pole traces out a path. And so we call that path a branch of the root locus. 
and um, it's equal to the number of closed loop poles because that's what it is representing is where the closed loop pole is. Um, not to distract too much, but you guys know it's Arts Walk tonight in Olympia. It's cool. Go walk around downtown. There's like all kinds of like music and other forms of art all around, and all these companies or all these businesses down there will like stay open and like have people in there playing band, bands playing or like visual artists presenting their stuff. It's pretty cool stuff. I recommend it. It's cool. Also, usually Oli um, uh, Oli Mega has an open house during Arts Walk too. I don't know if you guys know about Oli Mega, but it's like the like maker space downtown. And they make pretty cool stuff. I, I rolled through there when I was in that last Arts Walk, so it's fun. Also tonight is Luminaries. Uh, so that one's fun too. People like have these like luminary things and like march around and, and you can like join in. And then there's like these drums and stuff and it's really fun. And then there's also tomorrow there's the, uh, uh, there's, a, there's oh, what is it called? Parade of the Species, where like everyone makes these big like float things, like animals and all kinds of stuff. And they like walk around downtown, like this whole parade. It's really like, I don't even, I don't like parades. But Olympia parades, there's something else. Like I tell you, it's worth experiencing at least once. So that was a sidebar, but I thought you guys would might be interested and not want to miss out on that information. So the root locus. Also, Arbor root Day three. Festival. Really? Yeah. Where's that? Uh, wow. So many things in one weekend. And the weather is good, at least for now. But maybe it's changing. I don't know. Okay. Uh, uh, rule three. The root locus is symmetric about the real axis. Okay. Just like pole zero plots, right? They're symmetric about the real axis because they always come in conjugate pole pairs. Um, uh, on the real axis, there is locus wherever an odd number of roots, zeros or poles, are on the real axis, okay, to the right, and, lo and no locus elsewhere. So I'll read that again. On the real axis, there is locus wherever an odd number of roots are on the real axis to the right, and no locus elsewhere. So let me, I will sketch that just so that we can parse it a little bit easier. So it's a little bit hard to parse, but it's actually pretty simple to, uh, to get. So if we've got our uh, complex plane, and we've got some, we have some poles, and we've got some zeros. Um, poles doesn't really matter where all these things are. Um, okay, so on the real axis, it says there is locus wherever an odd number of roots are on the real axis to the right. So I'm going to use green here to show locus. When we're out here, so when we're out here, is there an odd number of poles or zeros to the right? It's Well, zero is even, technically. So there are no poles or zeros to the right of me. So that means that, that, there, that it's, it's even, so there's no locus. When I move to the left of this, now there is one polar zero to the right. So now I do have locus until here, and now I've got two to the right, so I don't have locus. That's even number. And then I go to the next one, three to the right, now I've got locus. The next one, four to the right, no locus. So I didn't construct the stuff off of the real axis, but I know everything about the locus on the real axis from just this rule. You start at the far right and you just walk your way left and you starts no locus and then as soon as you cross over one you go locus and just toggle back and forth. Um, and the reason for this uh, is the phase criterion. Um, so due to the fact that every off-axis pair of poles or zeros contributes no net angle because their angles are equally opposite. So if I looked at for instance, a test point right here. Then I'll, I'll change colors. 
If I looked at a test point, can everyone see red? Okay. Your silence is I'm taking as an affirmation. Um, so that angle is equal is equal and opposite to this angle. And since every every off the real axis um, uh, polar zero comes in a conjugate polar pair. They're always they're always uh, equal and opposite. So if I, if I looked at this is let's call this theta one, then this is negative. Well, I guess I drew an arrow, so I don't need to do that. That's also theta one, um, but this would be negative theta one, or I don't know. I guess I should be consistent. The arrows are pointing the opposite direction, so they cancel each other out. I drew them both in the same direction. Really, I should have drawn it this way, right? Then this would be negative theta 1, and this is theta 1. If you add those two together, though, this is going negative, this one's going positive. They've got to cancel, right? I'm trying to convince you. Do you guys feel convinced? Does it feel convincing? No? Positive 1 minus 1. Zero. You convinced of that? <laughs> I'll try that. I'll try that argument again. Let's blow this thing up. I think that's half of our problem. So if we're consistent with the direction we draw our angles. Then we call this theta one. Um, this is going to be three sixty minus theta one, so two pi minus theta one. And so, if you add these two angles together, you get two pi minus theta one plus theta one. And it equals 2 pi, or no net angle difference. Is that more convincing? I hope it was. I feel convinced. So, since that's the case, the only, the only poles and zeros that contribute to locus on the real axis are ones that are on the real axis themselves. Okay? So, this zero is going to affect it because it doesn't have a pole pair or a zero pair that's going to cancel its effect. So what is the angle from this zero to this point, this test point here? Zero, right? And what's the angle from this zero to this test point? Zero. zero. All of them have zero angle contribution. Therefore, if you summed up the angle contribution of all of the poles and zeros, we already showed that these ones will all cancel. These ones are all zero. When you weigh out here, you have zero angle, which does not meet the phase criterion. The phase criterion requires that it be multiples of pi, multiples of 180 degrees. And zero is not equal to pi. I'm pretty sure you guys are all convinced of that. Yes, I know. I'm here to tell you. Today and today only, zero is not equal to pi. So you have to once you but once you cross over and you do a test point here, now this zero has a contribution, right? It contributes what is the angle from this zero to this point back here? It's what zero wasn't equal to. It's pi, right? It's pi. And so the angle contribution is pi of that, and all the rest of them are zero. So that means that it does meet the angle criterion. Continue marching to the left, and then you toggle, and you add another pi. But oh, wait, if you add pi to pi, you get 2 pi, which is equal to zero. <laughs> it's equivalent to zero, we should say, um, in angles. And uh, et cetera. You can continue marching. Yeah. Woo! All right. I only cared if Jordan got it. The rest of you, tough luck.
the takeaway today is that 2 pi is equal to 0. But pi is not equal to 0. OK? When I say pi is equal to 0. No. 180? Negative 1? Degrees. OK, so that's, so that's rule 4. Um, and we, you know, that's, uh, that's a very nice, that's a very nice result. It's very useful, uh, as we'll see. Um, so then here's the last one, and it's a little, this is probably the most difficult one. Um, so missing poles and zeros are paired with infinite zeros or pol or, and, and poles asymptotically. So an open loop transfer function with a different number of poles and zeros is said to have missing poles or zeros. So if the numerator isn't, doesn't have the same order of polynomial as a denominator, then, which is common, right? Then you have missing zeros is the more common case. Um, this is because the root locus begins at open loop poles and approaches open loop zeros. But what about systems with missing open loop poles or zeros? So we said that, right? We said that they start at open loop poles and they go to open loop zeros, these branches of the root locus. But what happens if you don't have one to pair it with? That for the open loop pole, where is it going to go if it doesn't have an open loop zero, for instance? So uh, for these situations, the root locus begins or ends at poles or zeros at infinity, we say. So poles at infinity or zeros at infinity. For a system with more poles than zeros, which is quite common, so this is the usual case. So more poles than zeros means that in the transfer function, the denominator order is higher than the numerator order. So s squared plus whatever. In the numerator, you might have s plus whatever. And so this one's going to have what's at infinity? Zeros or poles at infinity? What is it missing? It's got, I mean, it's got, how many poles does this thing have? Three poles. How many zeros does it have? One. So it's missing zeros. It's missing two zeros. Therefore, it must have two zeros at infinity. Okay, that's our that's the current the situation we're talking about now, which is the mo most common situation. Um, some of the poles are going to approach zeros at infinity asymptotically. Conversely, systems with more zeros than poles, which are uncommon and are called non-causal systems, which is a whole discussion that we won't have. Uh, some branches of the root locus begin asymptotically from zeros at infinity. Excuse me. They begin at poles at infinity. <laughs> that was not just a typo. That was just wrong. Uh, the asymptotes originate at a single real axis intercept, intercept, sigma a, which can be shown to be related to the finite poles, pi, and finite zero, zi, with NP and NZ, the number of poles and the number of zeros, as follows. So sigma A is equal to the sum, let me make sure I get the right sign here. Yeah. The sum over all of the poles minus the sum over all of the zeros divided by the number of poles minus the number of zeros. So note that the imaginary parts of the poles and zeros cancel, so they needn't be considered. So when you put the pole in here, if it's a complex pole, or just purely imaginary pool, um, we don't need to take into account the imaginary part because there's always going to be a matching imaginary part. When you sum them all up, they're going to all equal zero. So we only care about the real part. 
And what this is, is I mean, let's think about the form of this for a moment. What is this? Um, how can we get a feel for this equation? Let's imagine you had no zeros. What would this be? It's sort of like the centroid, right? It's like the, the average real axis value of the poles. Could you be summing them all up? So say they were at like negative 5 and negative 10. You would sum them up, and you would get negative 15. And you divide it by the number of them, which they're 2. So you get negative 7.5. So you'd be right in the middle in between the two. So the, this center of the asymptotes is sort of like the average, but the average with zeros counting differently than poles so is negative. So the zeros affect it differently than the poles do. Uh, they have the opposite effect. So it's like the zeros are pulling, or the, the poles are pulling, and the zeros are sort of pushing this way. So, all right. Note that the imaginary parts of the poles and zeros cancel. Okay. Oh yeah, I already said that. With n big n being the number of poles minus the number of zeros, the number of asymptotes is the magnitude of n. So if the number of poles is greater than the number of zeros, then it's just already positive. But even if it's negative, we take the positive of it. That's the number of branches. Those are the number of zeros at infinity or the poles at infinity that we need, right? Each is a ray that originates at sigma a. And all that remains undetermined is the angle of each ray, which can be shown to be as follows for all integer values of m. So we say sigma, or not sigma, theta m is equal to 2m plus 1 times pi divided by np minus nz. So now that these repeat every n consecutive values of theta m. So if you go, so say you had three zeros at infinity. If you plugged in m equals 0, m equals 1, m equals 2, then that would be all the unique ones, because then you would start repeating as you go around. So you only have, as the number, the number of asymptotes that you have is the number of thetas that you need, because you're trying to find the angle of those asymptotes. So uh, let, let me, I, I guess I should try to illustrate that a little bit here. So let's say we had root locus. And we had, say, like our so two poles and no zeros. So we have two zeros at infinity, like that situation that we had. Um, then we're going to compute where the asymptote center is, which is sigma a. And it was the average of those two, right? So that's sigma a. Sigma a. And then we have the uh, asymptote angles. So there are how many asymptotes are there? One. Two, right? Because we've got two poles and no zeros. So we've got to get two zeros at infinity. So we've got to get two asymptotes. So the two asymptotes are going to always start here at sigma a and go outward at some angle. We could compute what those angles are. Uh, we, could, we could just plug in 0 for m here. That's going to be pi. So 0 times 2 is 0, plus 1 times pi is pi, which is not 0, and divided by the number of poles minus the number of zeros, which is 2, right, in this case. So we get pi over 2, which is 90 degrees. So the first asymptote goes up at 90 degrees. And the second asymptote, if you plug in m equals 1, gives us 2 plus 1, 3 pi divided by 2. So 3 pi over 2 is 270, right? 
or negative 90 degrees. So that's pointed straight down. And we've got our asymptote, our two asymptotes drawn. So we know that these, that the locus starts at these poles and it goes to these asymptotes. And we'll, we could fill in the rest. Why don't we just do that? We'll just fill in the rest here. So do we have locus out here on the real axis? Locus out here? No. We cross over a pole. Now do we have locus? Yes, locus. All the way until it hits another polar zero, at which time it, it has, after which it has no, no locus. Okay, then we know that, so we know that there's these two poles in the closed loop come together and then they split off. They have to split off and go to these asymptotes, right? The question of how it splits off, where it splits off, what angle it splits off can be answered. There are all these formulas that you can derive, but I don't, we, we actually don't need that in a lot of cases, so I don't worry about it. Um, in this case, they split off, uh, right at the asymptote, and they head off to plus and minus infinity. Um, now, oftentimes they don't exactly follow the asymptote. Uh, in this specific case, they do. There's nothing else happening in this problem. But even if you had like a zero here, um, this locus would essentially like pull over and go back. So it's not, uh, it's not something that always happens that you follow the asymptote exactly from its origin outwards. That just happens to be in this case. OK, so now we've got all of our rules. And we already accidentally did a root locus plot, sketched it. We didn't even mean to. It just sort of happened, right? We just did it. So. Um, I, I, instead of just having these, uh, these rules, R1 through 5, and then just feeling your way through it, I wrote out a procedure for going through it, which, take it or leave it, you can kind of do it however you want, but this is one way to do it. Um, so sketch the open loop poles and zeros is the first step. You got to start with your open loop poles and zeros because you know that the poles, open loop poles, are going to be where your root locus starts, and your open loop zeros are where they're going to, your locus is going to end. Um, so that's the start. Um, so we got to start there. Uh, then we're going to sketch the real axis root locus in accordance with rule four, which says that you know start far right, go to the left. So start with, uh, let's start with a win, right? Because this is easy. The, the stuff on the real axis is just counting, right? No locus, locus, no locus, locus. So start at the far right and then toggle for each polar zero. So no locus, locus, no locus. Always start at the right, though. If you start at the left, you're going to have it exactly opposite. And that is incorrect. Um, so there you go. Uh, just like the right hand rule does not work when you use your left hand. In this case, you need to start on the right before you can go to the left. I, I, we've all done it. We've all been like, but, and, and then, yeah. It looks really stupid, too. When you see somebody using their left hand trying to do the right hand rule, I'm just sitting there like, hmm, this isn't going to work, but it might be fun. OK, so the third step in the procedure is, if applicable, determine poles or zeros at infinity and draw asymptotes. Okay, So determine the number of finite poles and the number of finite zeros first. Then take the difference between them. If there are more poles than zeros, uh, that means that there must be absolute value of n zeros at infinity. Uh, if there are more zeros than poles, which remember is rare, uh, there are more, um, or then that means that there are absolute value of n poles at infinity. And if n equals zero, there are neither poles nor zeros at infinity, and the rest of this step should be skipped. So 
that's the kind of easy case. If you have an equal number of poles and zeros, you don't have to do any of these asymptotes. Um, the rest of it is to uh, compute the asymptote real axis intercept sigma a from equation 5.8. Then compute the uh, absolute value of n asymptote angles theta 0, theta 1, etc. Then sketch the asymptotes. So that's uh, that's the the procedure uh, up until this last step, which is so you got the asymptotes, you got your real axis stuff, and then finish the root locus sketch respecting all the rules. So the rules are, you know, be symmetric about the real axis. You can't start violating the real axis rule. You can't do those sorts of things. So you have to always respect all the rules and then finish the sketch. Um, so usually we can get a pretty qualitatively accurate sketch um, from the, at this point. Sometimes there are some question marks you don't know for sure. Like sometimes it might be unclear if it does go unstable at some gain. Um, but usually it's pretty clear. Uh, sketch the root locus for this transfer function. Okay? This is our example, first example. So, we'll do this one pretty quickly. Uh, so, our first step, what's our first step? Yeah, open loop poles and zeros. So, oh, I want it black. Okay, so our open loop poles and zeros, I'll do them in red. So where are they? Minus one. Minus one, there's a zero or a pole? Zero. zero. And what about the poles? Minus three, minus three and then minus five. Okay. So I say start with the win, get your real axis root locus drawn. Okay, this one's the easy one. It's like a freebie, right? So we start here and we march left. So no locus. Now we do locus, right? Locus, and then no locus, and then locus again, right? All the way. Which, so that already is looking like an asymptote, right? We already got something going off to infinity. Um, do we have asymptotes in this problem? That's the next thing we got to decide. Yes. We have one because we have two poles and one zero. So one of our poles has to go to a zero at infinity. And we actually don't even have to compute the asymptote in this case because we already know it. it already, we already know that on the entire negative real axis after this negative 5, we've got locus. But we could use the formula anyways. Um, let's just plug in. We only need one theta, right? So theta 0, if we plugged in m equals 0, is going to be 2 times 0 plus 1 pi divided by the number of poles minus the number of zeros, right? Which is 2 minus 1. So this gives us 1 times pi, so pi over 1, which is 1. So it gives us pi. So we know our one asymptote is going to be at 180 degrees. The center of the asymptote is very really irrelevant at this point, but we could also compute that, right? Sigma A, that's equal to, so the sum of the poles is minus, so negative 5 minus 3, uh, minus the zeros, which is minus uh, negative one, right? Uh, divided by the number of poles minus the number of zeros. 
And so what is that equal to? I believe you. Negative seven. So negative seven is like out here, right? And then the angle is pi. So our asymptote is being followed. We knew it was going to be there before, but it's good to do the math. Yeah. So for theta m, do you always just assume m equals zero? Uh, for theta m, oh, you can choose any numbers. Oh, so you just choose a sequence of, of so zero is easy to use because it cancels out this first term. So that's why I always use zero. <laughs> But you could use like negative 1, 0, and 1 if you needed 3. Um, you could use 0, 1, 2, 3, or you could use 0, 1, 2, or you could use 1, 2, 3, or you could use 49, 50, 51, for instance. Possible. Wouldn't do it, but it's possible. Yeah. So we've done it, guys. We've, we've sketched a root locus. We've sketched two. We didn't even, it wouldn't happen, didn't even mean to. So this one, this one was on purpose sketched it and how are we feeling about that pretty awesome yeah really yeah. no <gasps> did that really happen yeah. <gasps> oh my goodness. We were so therefore which is why we're completely lost, right? Oh no. I was so sure that we had done that. He said I'm gonna let you guys go this time early so that oh, crazy. Okay, okay, so I, I will we will rectify this somehow. I will go back and do that. But so my apologies. Uh, but I think that we can do this next example still. I think we can still do it. The sketching rules are kind of their own animal. So uh, so can we sketch the root locus for this transfer function? Let's try it together. You guys wait till the end of the lecture to tell me this. We just know this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, okay, so this is, uh, yeah, we got to do our pull zero plot. Um, first of all, no zeros. Awesome. So we just have poles. This pole is at negative five, so we could stick that guy on there pretty easily. Um, just put negative five pole. This is complex, right? And it's at, if you plugged in negative 1 plus and minus 1j1, one one, those are the two roots. So they're right here and right here. OK. So that's our open, that's our open loop poles. And we have no open loop zeros. So. Um, but we, we're not going to go there first because that's the harder one. We're going to start with our nice real axis analysis, right? Start at the right, march left, no locus. What happens here? Locus that way. Awesome. And then we have to face up to the fact that we have three poles and no zeros, right? So we need three asymptotes. Our, our uh, center location of those asymptotes is sigma a, right? And so what we can do, we, we're supposed to sum the, we can just take the real part of everything, right? Sum the poles. So we have negative 5 is this pole. This is negative 1, right? Negative 1. Negative 5. So negative 5 minus 1 minus 1, because there's two of them there. Remember that the imaginary parts are going to cancel out, so we just ignore them. And then there are no zeros, so we don't have to subtract anything from that. 
we divide it by number of poles, which is? Three minus the number of zeros, which is? And we get negative seven thirds, which is a little more than negative two, right? So it's somewhere, I'll use purple, it's somewhere around here, okay? And our angles are theta m. So let's do theta 0, 1, and 2, okay? So just, just for the heck of it. So remember that theta m is 2m plus 1 pi divided by 3 minus 0, right? So... Well, number of poles minus number of zeros, which is 3 minus 0. So if we plug in m equals 0 in this, what do we get? 5 thirds. Yeah. And then if we plug in m equals 1? Pi. And then plug m equals uh, 2? 5 pi over 3. Very good. So this is, so we can draw our asymptotes, and I'll draw them in gray, maybe. Uh, they're going to be at, so pi over 3 is 60 degrees, right? So like 60 degrees. And then pi is, we knew this one was going to be there, because we already saw that the real axis is going off that way. But, so we knew that was an asymptote. And then we go, uh, 5 pi over 3 is like negative 60 degrees, right? So that is our, those are our three asymptotes. And we can finish off the plot. We, we know that this pole is going this way, right? We already did that. This pole is probably going to follow this asymptote because it's closest to it. And this pole is probably going to follow this asymptote because it's closest to it. There's nothing else weird that's going on. I don't know zeros that are doing things to it. It's just just these poles, so they're pretty much going to just follow these, these asymptotes. It's kind of hard to draw something nice and smooth, but they're going to go off to infinity with these, asymptotically with these asymptotes. And we've got it. So we, we can, for instance, this is an open loop system. We don't know what the closed loop poles. We haven't solved for any closed loop poles for this system, but we found that if you increase the gain, what's going to happen to this system? The closed loop system is going to have poles that go along these asymptotes, which alarm bells should start going off when they go past this, right? The closed loop poles end up out here. It's unstable. So that means that for low gain, the system is stable, but for high gain, it's unstable. Dun, dun. Dun, dun. Yeah, and so we know that just from looking at the transfer function and applying a couple of rules, two equations, and we already know that. We don't know which values of gain that applies to, but we know that. Okay, so we'll pick this up on Monday. Uh, I will order stuff. Have a good weekend.